right, welcome everyone. So what we're talking about right now is colligative property. In colligative property, this word being said is not exactly something that is very common, where typically in chemistry, you can figure out the definition of something by looking at the word. So what these colligative properties are, it really is just a chemistry word. And it has to do with, it's basically when you have a property of a solution, a property that is determined by the number, and I'm going to underline the word number, of solute particles rather than what the actual substance is, rather than the actual substance. In other words, what you do is you take a look at how many particles there are, how many particles something breaks up into. If we had something like sugar, C6H12O6, okay? So if we had glucose. And glucose, we know that there are two major types of compounds. We talked about molecular and ionics, and we said that ionics were made of metals and nonmetals for the most part, or positive and negative charge. So is this ionic? No, it's not. So how many ions is it made of? It's not made of ions. It's made of molecules. So when they say what they do is they use a letter I, it's a lowercase i, and it's supposed to stand for ions. And what we say is that there's only one ion, quote unquote ion, for sugar. But let's take a look at something like salt, N-A-C-L. Well, salt is made of two ions, right? Because what two ions do we have? Na plus and Cl minus. Cl minus. So this is made of two ions. Then we could have something like magnesium chloride, which is used as rock salt. And how many ions are here? Well, how many magnesiums are there? One. One. And how many chloride ions are there? Two. Two. So that's a total of? Three. Three ions. And so we don't really care as much about what the substance is, but when it's a colligative property, what happens is the more ions you have, the greater the raising of the boiling point, which we call boiling point elevation, the greater the depressing of the freezing point, freezing point depression, and also the greater the depression of vapor pressure as well. And so the more ions that you have, that actually will, will help to determine that. And so that's what the colligative properties basically do. So we talk about four major things that are the colligative properties. One is that it elevates the boiling point. We call that boiling point elevation. The other one is called freezing point depression, freezing point depression. The other one is called vapor pressure depression. And the last one is just osmosis, okay? And when you, get, when you reach the osmotic pressure, okay, then that stops osmosis. So those are the four colligative properties. Again, these are just things that depend on how much solute, how many particles inside of your solvent do you have? Because the idea is, the more particles that you have in there, so if we imagine that we had this beaker and inside of there we had water and we put salt in there. What did we say? The water molecules want to escape, but what does the salt do to those water molecules that want to escape? They block them. It blocks them, it traps them, and it keeps them from escaping, which means our boiling point increases. That's what we were saying about that. Now, if we're talking about freezing point though, when something wants to freeze, what do you want the molecules to do when you're trying to freeze them? They're trying to come back together. And if they're trying to come back together, again, you can see those molecules get in the way, and that decreases the freezing point, okay? Vapor pressure works opposite of boiling point because if you're trying to boil something and there's salt inside of it, you're gonna have less vapor above the liquid, and so we say that our vapor pressure has also decreased. And so that's the idea of how the colligative properties work. So there are a few statements here, and what we're going to do is we're going to first watch this quick little video clip on the wood frog. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about some different things about why do they spread salt on streets uh, in the winter time? Why is salt adding to um, when you cook pasta, for example? And then we'll talk a little bit about antifreeze slash coolant. Okay. Here's the thing about North American wood frogs. They're small. Very small, but they're everywhere, just out of view, hiding on the forest floor. He's, he's camouflaged. His coloration is the same as the soil around him. See him here? 
He's cold. You can find them here in southern Ohio and all the way up to the Arctic Circle. But wherever they are, once it gets cold with the first sprinkle of ice, this frog does something I didn't know was possible. As soon as the frog touches, just touches an ice crystal. This animal is going to freeze. Freeze, freeze? Freeze, solid freeze. That touch of ice immediately sets off signals inside the frog, says Professor John Costanzo, that pulls water away from the center of its body, so the frog's internal organs are now wrapped in a puddle of water that then turns to solid ice. I, I still can't get over it. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. There is no breathing, no kidney function. The heart stops. And there'll be no heartbeat for a long period of time. You mean, as in no heartbeat? Right. Nothing. Flat by. For an hour or two? It could be for days, perhaps even weeks. Really? It sounds like it's virtually dead, no? We know that the frog isn't dead, but he's probably about as close as you can get to being dead. Yes. <laughs> so, from the outside, this little frog feels like a rock. Except that as he froze, the frog flooded itself with a kind of sugar. The frog's blood sugar is distributed through the circulatory system. It works like an antifreeze. It's harder for the water to freeze, so cells stay just damp enough for the animal to hold itself together. Until the springtime. When the days grow a little longer, and the ground gets a little warmer. And then, well, a kind of miracle happens. After weeks or months of no heart beating on, suddenly, there's a pulse. And that first heartbeat leads to another, and then another. And then within a day, in the case of this little frog, it took about mm, 10 hours, the animal literally comes back to life. Spontaneous resumption. A function. Why? We don't know. We don't know what triggers that event. And think how elegant a business this is. Because although the sun is warming up the outside of this little guy, somehow his insides, his heart, his brain, they thaw first. His insides warm up before his outsides. But somehow it all happens in perfect synchrony every spring. All right, so was that cool? Yeah. Okay, it's kind of crazy. So we know that it's remarkable because it can survive being frozen. And so basically, it appears as if it's dead, appears to be dead, because what happens to the heart? The heartbeat stops, yep, no heartbeat. For weeks, he said, okay? And so the idea was, what did they say as far as the arteries are basically filled with some, do you guys remember what kind of solution? Yeah, it's a sugar solution, it's a glucose solution. So the arteries are filled with a glucose solution. And what that does is, it basically works just like the salt does, and the particles on the inside are trying to come together and freeze, but what does it do to the freezing point? It lowers it. It decreases the freezing point, it lowers the freezing point, and so what ends up happening is it's then able to thaw out after, and so remain, and to remain alive. And so people are studying this because the whole idea of, do you remember what we called it? Cryogenics. cryogenics. With cryogenics, that people are studying to try to see if we can do this with humans as well. To be able to inject a certain type of solution so that something like that could happen as well. Okay. The next question is, why is salt spread on icy streets? So, do you know what happens? Well, we have an idea, right? What happens when they spread the salt on? It melts. It melts because what does it do to the freezing point? It lowers it. It lowers the freezing point, so we call it freezing point depression, okay? We call it freezing point depression. And so what ends up happening, now they put the rock salt down and same thing. Those molecules that thought that they could come together, instead there are salt molecules that are around them. And so those molecules that ends up melting around it. Why do you think that CaCl2 would be a better choice than NaCl? Well, CaCl2 has how many ions? One and two, which makes a total of three ions. Versus NaCl has how many ions? Two. Two, because it's got one Na and one Cl. So CaCl2, because it has the three ions, this ends up being the better choice, and typically it's more expensive to purchase as well. And so the CaCl2 is a better choice because it has more ions. It does more of that, um, the getting in the way when the molecules are trying to freeze. Okay, there are two things as far as adding um, salt to cooking water. So we know that flavor is one reason, but then the other reason we talked about is the same as what we were talking about earlier. What happens, the molecules are trying to boil, and what does it do? 
it increases the boiling. boiling point. We call it boiling point elevation. And so what it does is it raises the boiling point. And so why is it, why does that matter? Why does raising the boiling point even matter? What happens then? It's actually cooking at a higher temperature. And so then if it's cooking at a higher temperature, then it's gonna cook faster. faster. Awesome. It raises the boiling point. So then it ends up um, cooking at a higher temp means faster cooking. And so you can cook the pasta a little bit faster as well. All right, last thing. Auto engines use ethylene glycol and water as antifreeze. It says, why not just use water or ethylene glycol? Well. Either one of them, unless they're mixed together, they're not gonna get in the way of each other. So in order to decrease the freezing point or raise the boiling point, you actually need a solution. So it must be a solution. You have to have a solution, okay? Otherwise, it won't decrease as much. Okay, in order to, in order to either raise the boiling point or decrease the freezing point. So I didn't know when I was younger, I didn't know that antifreeze and coolant were actually the same thing. This container says antifreeze and coolant. But usually, if you go to buy it in the summer, guess what it says? Coolant. And if you go to buy it in the winter, it says antifreeze. But it's actually the same stuff, okay? So the question is, how again does it work? Well, if the temperatures are really, really, really low, then what happens at low temperatures? At low temps, the molecules do what? They get in the way of what? Of it coming together and freezing. So the low, at low temps, the solution keeps everything in the engine from freezing, going through the lines. And then because it decreases the freezing point. So that's our freezing point depression. But in the summertime, at high temps, what does it do? Keeps it, it from boiling. Yep, it traps the molecules and it keeps them from boiling. It keeps molecules also in the engine from boiling. And that's basically it for talking about the collective properties.